All right, <clears throat> so here we go with uh, our first video lecture for unit number two. We are going to, um, there's three parts to this video. I'm going to go through the first part today. So um, here we have the, the first key element, which is the development, the key um, idea, the development of religions and culture. So unit two, uh, which goes from 600 BCE to 600 CE, uh, we normally call this the classical era. So there's going to be a lot of religions and cultures that are going to develop during this time period. And that's what we're looking at. We're going to look at first. So religions are used to unite people. They're used to reinforce hierarchies, whether there's social hierarchies or uh, patriarchal hierarchies, like women and men. Uh, they're also used to legitimize rulers, like convincing people that you should follow what the king or the emperor says. And of course, religions are used to generate conflict, right? Fighting because of religion. So uh, how do you unify people? Well, you give people a code to live by. And this is seen in the Ten Commandments of the Jewish and Christian faiths. Uh, reinforcing hierarchies like the caste system, right? which is what Hinduism does. We see the justification of... Um, of rulers, you know, people who are either claimed to be God kings, like divine kings, or divine rulers, or divinely chosen, like, you know, Confucianism and the Mandate of Heaven in China, uh, or they claim to be, uh, you know, divinely chosen as well, like Zoroastrianism, for example. Uh, and also we see conflict during this time period. Uh, so one of the major examples, of course, is called the Jewish diaspora, when the Jews were forced away from their homeland uh, by the Assyrians and later on by the Romans and their, you know, city of Jerusalem and their uh, monuments and temples that were destroyed. Now, Judaism is the oldest monotheistic religion. Uh, it began in time period one originally. But we kind of see it transform and codify. That means like it becomes written down into the Torah or the Hebrew scriptures during time period two. Uh, we see that Judaism is in a constant change of, uh, of like it's always evolving. All right. So as the Jewish people experience, you know, you know, conflicts and problems throughout their history, uh, the religion changes uh, to kind of accommodate or explain those uh, conflicts. And uh, remember, the diaspora is going to push the Jews uh, across the Mediterranean and throughout the Middle East, where they're always going to remain uh, culturally uh, you know, identifiable. They're going to unite themselves into small Jewish communities. Uh, but because they are always going to be the minority group, regardless of where they live, it, is always, uh, it always tends to lead to anti-Semitism or discrimination against Jews because it's always easy to blame uh, the small population group. So here we see the diaspora uh, of the Jewish people, right? Their homeland is here in Jerusalem. They're going to be forced under the Romans and the Assyrians before that uh, to go to other parts of the Mediterranean to settle there. And eventually they're going to spread uh, throughout the Mediterranean, throughout Europe. Now, Hinduism, again, also, just like Judaism, began in time period one. It was known as the Vedic religion, which came from the Aryans who migrated into India. And this religion also changed over time and eventually will become known as Hinduism. Um, and it develops the political structure and the social structure of India. Remember, the caste system is based on Hindu beliefs, uh, focusing on reincarnation, right? And that your status in, uh, the, in society, your social hierarchy, your, your case is based on the life that you lived in the previous lifetime. And whether or not you did good or bad karma determines your, your, your upper class or lower class status. And uh, the priest, of course, would be the highest, the holiest people, the highest karma people. They're known as the Brahmins. And they're going to be part of the upper class. Right? Those are educated people in India. So the Indo-Aryans, right, they moved from Central Asia up here. Uh, they migrated into India. And that starts, you know, way back in time period one. Uh, and then we see Hinduism develop more and more in time period two. 
Now, new religions are going to come to prominence, come to popularity during this time. And uh, the first of the main ones is going to be Buddhism. Now, Buddhism originally started as part of Hinduism. Uh, and they share some similar beliefs, like they believe in enlightenment, they believe in uh, reincarnation. Right? But unlike Hinduism, Buddhism rejects the caste system. It says that it doesn't matter what social status you're born into, uh, they believe that everyone, every soul is equal to one another. So Buddhism does reject uh, the caste system. Now Buddhism also has a founder, right, a creator, unlike Hinduism and unlike Judaism. Uh, and the founder of Buddhism is known as Siddhartha Gautama, and he becomes uh, known as the Buddha or the Enlightened One. Now, unlike Buddhism, unlike Hinduism, Buddhism also is um, going to spread beyond India. It's going to go into you know the Southeast Asia, and it's going to go into China mainly, uh, and it is through the efforts of merchants on trade routes. And through missionaries, where we see the spread of Buddhism. And Buddhist temples also served as schools. Now, one of the reasons why Buddhism became as popular as it did was because of Emperor Ashoka, or Ahsoka. Uh, he was a Mauryan emperor. Remember, the Mauryans were the first dynasties in India. Uh, they eventually got replaced by the Guptas, right? Those are two classical dynasties of India. Well, the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, he, was a, he became Buddhist. He converted to that religion, and he helped popularize and spread the religion throughout India. Right, so that's Gautama, that's Ashoka right there. Uh, and here we see the spread of Buddhism throughout um, Southeast Asia, and then East Asia, right? China, Korea, and Japan. Now, uh, Confucianism is the Jap uh, Chinese philosophy. Uh, remember, at this time, Confucianism is simply a philosophy. Later on, in time period three, it will become a religion uh, when it becomes Neo-Confucianism and incorporates more, about, more ideas about spirituality in the afterlife. But originally, Confucianism is a philosophy about how to keep harmony in society, how to get everyone to work together. And I believe that it was based on relationships, right? So you have relationships between father and son and husband and wife, uh, old people and young people, and rulers and subjects, those sort of relationships, and, and then the equal one of friend and friend. So the idea is that everyone has a relationship to one another and that there's certain expectations of those relationships. So the son has to be obedient to his father. The father has to take care of the son. Uh, the wife is also obedient to her husband, and the husband has to provide for his wife. So each role has a responsibility to one another. And uh, by developing these relationships and showing respect above all else, showing respect to each other, then you're going to have this harmonious society where everything kind of just works together and everyone just kind of gets along. Of course, all these ideas come from the famous philosopher Confucius. He wrote a book, or his followers wrote a book called uh, The Analects, uh, and it becomes one of the major books in Chinese history, uh, and it will be studied by Chinese scholars, Confucian scholars, uh, for, you know, all the way into the 20th century. Now, Confucianism also reinforces the idea of the mandate of heaven, right? the idea that the Chinese emperors, the dynasties, are chosen by heaven, by the gods, uh, and they grant the emperor the, or the dynasty the permission. They grant them permission to rule. And the emperor has to maintain, uh, you know, be a good emperor, be honest, be fair, be loyal, uh, not be corrupt, not be, uh, you know, violent. And um, as long as the emperor is able to do this, then his family will be granted the permission to rule by the heavens. Uh, Confucianism also incorporates ancestral veneration as a form of, um, you know, uh, spiritual beliefs, uh, believing that the ancestors can help you and you have to pro show proper respect to them. 
this also kind of falls with filial piety or piety, the idea that each individual has to show respect to their elders, their parents, and their grandparents, and that the individual uh, wishes and hopes are not as important as that of the family. Now, of course, the who decides what is important to the family is the eldest male. So this, also, this Confucianist beliefs or Confucian philosophies also reinforces patriarchy. Remember, China is going to be one of the most patriarchal societies um, in world history. So Confucianism is always going to be tied with China. It's different versions of Confucianism will spread to Japan and Korea, but that will be later on. Uh, Taoism is another major religion, uh, or philosoph philosophy, I should say, uh, sometimes spelled with a T. But Taoism is a uh, philosophy in China. Uh, and remember, the, for, for the Chinese, Taoism and Confucianism, they were not exclusive. So many people were both Taoists and Confucianists at the same time. So Taoism is all about the ideas that there needs to be a balance between humans and nature. And that if everyone tries or strives to have that balance in their own lives, uh, then we'll have social harmony. And they come up with this idea of these energies of the yin and the yang. Now, a lot of Chinese culture and practices, of course, we see a lot of influence of Taoism uh, in there. So, for example, the practice of acupuncture, where we stick little sharp needles in different parts of your body. The idea is that by puncturing the body, you're releasing uh, some of the built-up energies, whether you have too much yin or too much yang. Acupuncture kind of helps balance it out. And therefore, you could figure out uh, or you could see how you can feel better or relieve stress or relieve, you know, a sickness by having more of a balance. A lot of art is going to be based on landscape, on nature. So you're not going to see a lot of, like, portraits and people in Chinese uh, art. Uh, you're going to see a lot of, like, mountains and forests and rivers, natural landscape type of thing. Uh, they're also going to work on alchemy, which is this idea of that you can change one matter uh, to another. So, for example, you could change like metal, like uh, say iron, uh, to gold, right? Uh, and this is kind of like a, a kind of like primitive, superstitious version of uh, what we will now call chemistry. But it will be the Taoists who eventually will develop gunpowder. Uh, the story or the legend goes is that they were trying to create an elixir for eternal life, uh, and instead they created gunpowder. All right, uh, Lao Zhao is the founder of Taoism. Confucius, of course, is the founder of um, Confucianism. Now, Christianity is our next major religion. It is a universal religion because it tries to spread across the world, just like Buddhism does. Now, of course, originally Christianity was part of Judaism. Uh, they are monotheistic, just like Judaism was. And it will spread throughout Afro-Eurasia because of the popularity, or gain popularity, with missionaries and merchants. And also the Romans will at one point uh, adopt and... Um, claim Christianity as their official faith, even though early on the Roman Empire persecuted Christians because they failed to show the proper respect and honor the emperor as a god. Now, uh, Christianity is based on the teachings and the life of Jesus of Nazareth uh, and his disciples. And um, we see that uh, martyrdom, that means people sacrificing themselves, to show their devotion to God or to the faith becomes a major kind of like central belief where Christians, where especially during the early years when Christians were being persecuted. Now, Christianity will gain popularity, especially amongst those who have, um, who don't have much in this physical world. Uh, so women who were being persecuted or, or being held down uh, because of patriarchy, the poor people, who have no social mobility, no opportunities to move up, and slaves who you know work and you know have no personal gain. Uh, these groups of people are going to be the first to convert to Christianity, 
because after all, Christianity not only preaches equality, spiritual equality, but it also teaches the uh, possibility of salvation, right? That in the next life, right, after death, that you have the chance to be saved and you can spend your life, eternal life, in the kingdom of heaven. So Christianity, especially popular amongst people who you know have nothing available or, or limited resources here on earth. Now, uh, Christianity will kind of like take a major step into popularity thanks to Emperor Constantine. Remember Constantine, uh, he converts to Christianity and he decides to stop the persecutions and allows Christianity to be practiced freely. And eventually we see Christianity become the major religion of the Roman Empire. And so we see Jesus and we see Constantine here. So Christianity will spread throughout the Mediterranean, right? So we have parts of Africa, right, North Africa. We see a lot of Western Europe, uh, but also the Middle East, right, Turkey and Syria and Judea, these regions in the Middle East. So Christianity is going to be a Mediterranean world religion. Uh, we also have philosophy. Uh, so we have the, the, you know, Confucianism, Taoism, which are the... Uh, Chinese philosophies, but the Greeks and the Romans also had their philosophy, uh, and we see kind of like a mix of philosophy and science kind of go together, uh, and the famous philosophers, uh, for the Greeks at least, we have uh, Plato uh, and Aristotle, and uh, combine these philosophers, kind of come up with these ideas about logic, of how to uh, formulate arguments based on facts, and the evidence that, are, that is observable, right? Uh, and that when you make a claim, you have to back it up with specific evidence. Um, and the, these philosophers, along you know, with Socrates, is the other, you know, one of the other three, the third of the, the big three of the Greeks, uh, these ideas would eventually be carried down or passed down to other societies uh, especially the Muslims and the Byzantines, which come later on in time period or unit number three. All right, so here we see a famous picture of, of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, Plato believed that there is this perfect world beyond the physical world, this world of the perfect forms of spiritual, kind of like a spiritual world where everything is perfect and that uh, our goal on earth is to try to be as close as possible to this perfect idealized spiritual world that exists somewhere in the sky type of thing. Um, Aristotle was different. He believed that everything we can understand and know about the world is right here in front of us. That's why his hand is facing down, you know, pointing towards the earth. Everything is in front of us. Everything can be observed. And if you can understand how everything works, then you can make everything better. So Greek philosophy and, and science, uh, it, it, you know, these are the cornerstones of the Greco-Roman uh, culture, and we'll see that it will spread to other parts of the world, and eventually will become even more popular later on in world history when we get to the Renaissance. Uh, religions also affected, of course, women, and affected the status of women, uh, you know, where uh, for example, Christianity and Buddhism, we see the po uh, rising popularity of monasticism, of women becoming monks or nuns, um, while negatively we see Confucianism uh, kind of putting uh, restrictions on women. Uh, other religions that have been around the whole world kind of continue. Uh, so shamanism or animism. Uh, is uh, two kind of like major polytheistic religions. Uh, they're not codified, meaning that there's no like written rules, there's no founders, uh, and they, you know, the gods and the spirits and the, you know, they vary from place to place. Uh, but we see these two, shamanism and animism, they're basically the same thing. But we see them in Central Asia, uh, the Central Asian people like the Mongols and the Turks, uh, they're going to, in the Huns, they're going to practice shamanism. Uh, North Americans, uh, the Native Americans, also we call these Amerindians, 
they're going to be uh, shamanism. Uh, and in sub-Saharan Africa, they're going to also practice animism. And these two religions, again, they focus on the supernatural, on spirits and gods and belief in magic, and that there is a kind of like that the physical world and the spiritual world um, uh, can interact with each other. Uh, ancestor veneration is a big part of uh, animism as well. So the Bantus will practice it, the Chinese will practice it, uh, we see that in South America and the Andes, they will practice a version of it as well. Uh, but ancestral veneration, again, is a belief that you can pray to your ancestors and they can come and help you and guide you uh, in your time of need. Uh, the Romans, surprisingly, uh, they also practice ancestor veneration before they converted to Christianity. And then, of course, they stopped practicing it. Uh, we see uh, the development of literature and drama during this time. Uh, literature and drama. Um, so we see, you know, the Greeks, they have the tragedies, which, you know, are all sad, and the comedies, which are all positive. Uh, but we also have the Indian um, epics, right? The, the Hinduism has a lot of epic stories there. Uh, the other epics include those of Homer, like the Iliad and the Odyssey. Those are famous poets about, you know, poems about heroes and warriors and the gods. Uh, we see religion also take shape in, um, in architecture. Right, we see a lot of influence. Uh, so the Hindu temples of India, right, they're going to have a very distinct uh, appearance. Uh, we're going to see a lot of Buddhist temples. They're sometimes called stupas, like this one, right? Uh, and these stupas were built all over India, especially during the time of Emperor Ashoka. Um, you know, the Greeks had their gods, right? And they had temples like the Parthenon, uh, which is a temple to, of course, Athena. Uh, she was the goddess of Athens. Uh, the Romans, uh, they also had temples, right? The Pantheon. Let's see if I can find it. No. Uh, the Pantheon is their major temple. Uh, for the Roman gods, but they also had this stuff like the Colosseum, which is where the gladiators fights will take place. Uh, in Mesoamerica, we have the Mayan pyramids, which we kind of see here. Uh, these step pyramids uh, that were used as temples as well, and we find them in the cities of Chichen Itza and Tikal. Uh, the Great Wall, uh, remember, Great Wall kind of originally. It starts during, you know, time period two at the beginning during the Qin dynasty, but it will be a continuous project to be expanded and rebuilt and expanded and rebuilt uh, throughout all of time period two and all the way into at the end of time period three. Uh, terracotta army, remember this is the burial of uh, the tomb of the first Chinese emperor, Emperor Shi Huangdi, who was the founder of the Qin dynasty. Uh, this is an aqueduct that we see built by the Romans, and this is going to be in modern-day France. Uh, remember, they would use concrete uh, to build these things to last, and obviously they've lasted for close to 2,000 years. Uh, and this, you know, aqueduct to transport water into the cities uh, to provide a clean water supply. Uh, last thing we're going to talk about is synchronization. Remember, synchronization is the mixing of different cultures together to create something brand new. And this occurs during the Hellenistic times, that means during the Greek era, when the Greeks were controlling a large territory under after Alexander the Great. Uh, and we see that the Greeks and the Buddhist cultures synchronized. So in uh, modern day Pakistan, uh, which is in South Asia, uh, right next to India, uh, we see statues of the Buddha, right? Uh, but the Buddha is dressed in Greek clothing, and the statue is made in the style of the Greek statues. So that means that there were Greeks living there, and they were creating these works of art, um, and they were working on Buddhist statues, or statues of the Buddha. And these were known as the Gandahar Buddha statues. And it shows us a physical example of this mixing of cultures that we call synchronization. All right, so that's it for part number one. Thank you for listening and watching, and I'll see you 
for part two coming up next.